All right. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. I'm Amy Hermes. I'm the moderator of the uh, second episode of our first season of Zoom Speakeasy coming to you on Zoom TV. Uh, like the last time we came together, we'll all be talking about weathering the storm of uncertainty. And we'll be talking about the implications of global disruption as it relates to cloud infrastructure and service resiliency. Uh, uh, today, I've uh, listed out on the PowerPoint screen that you're all looking at, um, you can see our featured speakers and the topics they'll be talking to. Uh, and I'll take everybody very quickly through how we're going to be running this particular uh, event. So these are the moderator's notes. Um, you'll hear uh, four different three-minute lightning talks from four different featured speakers. And during the three-minute talk, uh, we'll encourage attendees to go ahead and type relevant questions and comments into the Zoom chat. Uh, when the featured speaker is talking. Once the three minute uh, lightning talk is complete, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll select from some of the questions or comments posted in the chat and you'll be given the mic will unmute you to go ahead and engage with the speaker for up to two minutes. And then at which time we'll go ahead and move to the next lightning talk. Uh, at the very end of the four lightning talks, we'll be have a 15 minute Q&A session uh, at the completion and we can go ahead, you'll raise your hand uh, in the Zoom and then we'll go ahead and unmute you and you can pick a particular topic that is tied directly back to one of the featured speakers. Um, if you have a particular idea, and we'll cover this at the very end for a future uh, topic for the speakeasy, there is a email at the bottom, cloud2020 at googlegroups.com. And that will go to the founding members of this particular uh, uh, series. And that's uh, myself, Mark Teeley, Rich Miller, Rob Hirschfeld, and Mike Kyle. Uh, so without further ado, I would say, are there any questions? But uh, we're just going to move forward right now. And thanks to the attendees for joining. And we are recording this. Uh, so this will be uh, accessible at a later time. And folks can go ahead and uh, actively engage with us then. So without further delay, let me go ahead and turn this over to our first uh, guest speaker, Exploring Borderless Work Environments with Mark Teeley. You may Thank proceed, you. sir. Thank you, Amy. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, as you might imagine, the uh, the impact of um, uh, the coronavirus, the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, has caused uh, virtually every organization to reconsider uh, how they enable the workforce. And, and you can imagine that almost every uh, CEO is sitting at a table, a virtual table, talking to their team over Zoom or Skype or some other medium. Um, uh, asking them, what's our constraint? And um, unfortunately, the constraint is, is people. The people are in the process and we need those people in the process, but we can't always keep them working. So in light of that, um, I think obvious need for most organizations um, in order to weather this, uh, in fact, to be able to potentially come out the other side stronger uh, than before, uh, having a, a, a broad scope plan and strategy and set of policies around uh, how working without borders uh, um, can be enabled, I think is critical. And so when you think about working remotely without borders, it has different meaning and characteristics depending on what it is you're trying to do or how you work. And for some, it's just home office exclusive. For others, it's road warrior almost exclusive. Um, and for others, it's a different combination. But the bottom line is that you need to be, reg regardless of where you are, to be able to complete your work. Um, and so that doesn't matter whether you're in the office or at an airport or in a hotel, you need to be able to complete your work. And so your applications and personal infrastructure need to be able to adapt and support location, sovereignty, uh, information security, et cetera, without you having to make uh, unique adjustments. What are the drivers? Well, whether we like it or not, uh, you mentioned the biggest link, which I talked about already, the current crisis we, we covered already. Um, but edge use and automation, et cetera, are likely to accelerate as a result of the pandemic, which only puts more emphasis on the ability to work and function um, using digital tools uh, and replacing as many of the manual processes as we have today with digital tools so that getting someone to work from home can be successful. Companies that solve for borderless working set themselves up to be stronger on the other side of this crisis. So what are the risks? Well, gaps in training. Um, as with anything, you don't want to just start out there and say, here's a PC or here's a a VPN, use it on your client at home. Uh, those are strategies for failure and opening up the company to risk. Uh, so having policy and um, and uh, is is incredibly important. Expectation that the employee will know what's best at any given remote situation. 
Uh, not everybody has thought through security. They don't know what it means to have their neighbor looking over their shoulder or their husband or their kid uh, using the computer that they happen to be using for work, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really critical for um, success. Effective leadership for remote workforce. Can't be underestimated the importance of understanding how to work with people remotely. Uh, how to consider the future. We're already in the future. We just can't see it clearly. As mentioned earlier, trends already underway are likely to be accelerated. You can't consider productivity. My apologies. You can't you gotta consider- Gotta love that time limit yeah. timer. I love it. Yeah. Without taking into account, you know, tool, application, performance, and support. So keep in mind, when you enable people, there's security, there's usability and all that stuff, but performance and productivity are key to um, anyone working from anywhere and remote is a key challenge. So a real serious consideration. And I ran over, but thank you. No, you did, you did great. We love it. So just as a reminder to folks on the phone or watching in, um, if anybody has a question or a comment for Mark, you can go ahead and post it in the chat uh, and we'll go ahead and unmute your line. Um, if there are no questions or comments, comments for Mark, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, move to the next speaker and then you'll have a chance to again engage with Mark uh, at the end of the call if anybody's interested. So let me just ask one more time. Um, if anybody else uh, has a question or a comment or a rebuttal for Mark, and we'll move into the two minute uh, follow on time. All right, it looks like uh, Rob Hirschfeld has a question. So we'll go ahead and unmute your line. And Rob, you can go ahead and ask your question of uh, Mark. Rob? I'm here. Oh, there we go. So, so Mark, I mean, one of the things about, about this, though, I mean, you're talking about work, and ultimately that means employers are responsible for that, you know, for that work. Does that then entitle work uh, employers to have more surveillance rights or more, um, more control over what, what people do or how they work or when they're online? It feels like that could translate into sort of a 24-7 work monitoring state? No, that's, that's a, Rob, that's a great question and it's a real risk, frankly. And um, I think we've all seen and even some of us even talked about the fact that um, a major failure by any organization or leader uh, is one that thinks enabling people to work from home and quite requires some sort of punch clock on their computer that allows them to know what they're doing at any given moment of the day. Um, you know, that's, that's not success in any environment. So I don't know why you would think that would be success at home. Um, the fact is, is that I shouldn't say the fact is the fact from a uh, several reports that I've read about people working from home is that uh, over the course of a year, there is anywhere from one and a half to as many as three weeks of additional productivity for that working at home individual. So just using the law of averages combined with providing appropriate leadership on how to communicate with people, how to create measures that are effective for both of you. Um, is really critical to the success, but but putting in more draconian measures to monitor what they do and determine whether they slept in for half an hour uh, or you know work through lunch or something, I think is a is a great way to uh, just have people leave the company and and fail in general. Sounds like a new leadership, a whole new leadership paradigm for companies then. Absolutely. So we have time for uh, just one more question. Uh, and I was going to call on Don, who put a question um, into the chat. Uh, Don, I'm going to try to unmute you. You should be able to unmute yourself at this point, I'm hoping. Uh, if you want to go ahead and... I, I think I have to promote him to be a panelist. Uh, no, no, he's up. No, no. Oh, good. He's good now. Don, if You're you want to go it. ahead and Thank ask you. your question of Mark Teeley, go right ahead. So it, it's, sort of, it's sort of in the same line of, as, as Rob's question. Um, what kind, you know, you talked about, you know, a shared computer at home being, you know, you know, somebody's working on that during the day, but somebody else is using it for leisure time in, in, in the evening. What kind of organization, you know, would, wouldn't be providing, you know, a managed device um, for, their, for their worker at home on the expectation that that device is only used for work? Yeah, well, it's, it's a, again, it's a good question, but when you think about it, Don, and I don't know who you work for, I don't know whether you come from the, you know, the, like some of us do, the ivory tower-ish of, of Silicon Valley-oriented companies, but 
most of us uh, make assumptions for what a company understands and plans for relative to remote work because it's relatively common in that environment. But for many companies where, with the exception of maybe traveling sales folks, nobody else in the company has any privileges to work from home, or very few do, the idea of a structured approach to how to enable them from working from home, especially under emergency circumstances, is potentially fraught with considerable number of risks. And even if you have a unique system that you provide someone to work from home, and obviously that's the right approach, but assuming you do provide that, if you don't provide the appropriate training and policy and governance uh, and or uh, you know, dual authentication, uh, et cetera, and management tools for that client, then you're making the assumption that no one else in the room or no one else in the house will ever accidentally get access to that. And you know, a typical company with any kind of security profile would suggest that the clients be locked whenever somebody walks away from their desk. And so the comfort associated with being at home provides additional risk, especially if you haven't pre-planned and pre-communicated and trained that into the people providing the service and those people that are using it. I hope that makes sense. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks, Don, for asking the question. Appreciate it. Uh, at this point, we're now going to turn over to the next speaker, which is Rich Miller, talking about understanding data validity. You may proceed, sir. Thank you very much, Amy. I'm Rich Miller of Telematica. We're a Silicon Valley consultancy with a focus on product strategy and distributed computing, distributed data, and the networks that make it all happen. And for the past several years, we've been focused on what I've come to call data husbandry, the care and feeding of data as both the raw material into and the product of today's high-tech industries. And today, I'd like to talk a little bit about aspects of data stewardship and responsibility, which is now all the more important in these times of uncertainty and distributed uh, work. And these aspects, data stewardship and data responsibility begin well before the data scientists or the data anal business analysts start digging in for value in the data. It actually begins before data engineering teams onboard the data into a data lake or a cloud data warehouse a database, distributed ledger, or any other con of these constructs, our consultancy engagements almost always start with the quality of the data. It's fit for purpose, a determination of what must be done at the beginning to assure ourselves that we'll be working with the right ingredients. And this is the case with any physical manufacturing process and why wouldn't it be the same with big data analytics or the application of machine learning? You need to rely on the quality of your ingredients. Anyone responsible for cooking a meal, refining oil, producing vaccines, or generating a credit score knows this. Yet we are continually surprised at how little attention is given to the pedigree of the data that's being used. So let's start with a few of the concepts that come in at the beginning regarding data quality. Think of getting a data set with a data sheet that's associated with it, just as you would when you buy a piece of equipment. And along with that comes not just the instruction manual, but a set of requirements. And um, in, those cases, what you're looking at is, and looking for, before you do anything with the data, is you want to know a lot about its background, its pedigree. You want to think about the authentication of the source. Has the identity of the source, the author or issuer of the data, been verified? If the supplier, the place from which we've gotten the data, is an intermediary, someone in between us and the originator. Have they provided a documented chain of custody or a chain of responsibility? What about the lineage of this data set that we've just gotten? Is the data 
altered or unaltered? Do we expect it to have been altered in its path from the originator to where we are today? And if it has been changed, are those changes verifiably documented? But ultimately what we need to know is whether after receiving this data set, after authenticating, after getting the data provenance, after getting the data lineage, is the data still valid? Has the issuer or the owner of that data revoked it or revised it? Is it mastered? And do we have the authoritative version? So this is what we mean in combination to be data validity. And I want to point out that over here on the upper right, there's this $50 bill. It's a series 1928 gold certificate. I can do a pretty good job of authenticating its source. It was the US Mint. I don't know the chain of custody uh, or the chain of responsibility of that particular bill. It might be being used in some sort of money laundering situation. So I may need to be careful. Other situations, no. Data lineage, I know it's been unaltered. Data validity, I do know and I need to check whether that bill is still valid. Can I still take it to the bank? This whole notion of data validity becomes even more important today when we think about GDPR, CCPA, and all of the privacy preservation that goes into data. And the citizen or the source may have a right to revoke that data that's already in my possession before I'm using it. This is what we mean when we start to talk about fit for purpose and data validity. And so with that, I'll, I'll end and open it for questions. Thank you so much, Rich. Does anybody who's uh, attending the Zoom have a question? You can go ahead and um, ask the question. Actually, I see a question from Odd, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, unmute uh, Odd's speaker, and you can go ahead and ask your question. Hey, all, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Hey, how are you? So, uh, apologies in advance. This isn't intended to be reductionist. I, I, I totally buy into your commentary. The concept of garbage in and garbage out has been around for ages and especially in tech space why is it so hard to get this right <laughs> you know it's because what constitutes what makes that data set garbage um is not just one thing it's not just data cleanliness it's not just uh data validity um it can be so many different ways in which the data is inappropriate or, and as Gina will be speaking about a little bit later, it can be tainted with bias for an, any number of different reasons. And you're absolutely right. Why is it hard to get, um, why is it hard to get this concept in place? Because everybody is so desperate to extract gold from this raw ore there is an incredible amount of pressure to take what you already have or what you can put your hands on and get an understanding out of it. Too often, the reason why data is garbage in is because it was collected for a purpose not meant for this kind of analysis. And often, one can look at everything else about that data set and say, nicely done, just not good for the, the particular process I'm interested in. If I actually knew how to say and get that garbage in, garbage out concept uh, beaten into people's heads, I would do it in a second. So when you come up with that right, uh, right story or right anecdote to get it, let me know, Odd. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Lots of good questions uh, right now in the chat, but uh, just to keep us on time, uh, we might be able to come back to those at the end, and apologies for the disruption there. Um, but we'll go ahead now and like to call up uh, Gina Rosenthal, made a name links. Uh, welcome, so happy to have you as a guest speaker today. Uh, Gina's gonna talk about uh, privacy. And let me just make sure you're unmuted. So there you go, give me one second. There you go. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, hey, y'all. I'm going to talk about privacy, and this is an outdated concept, but before we get into it, I want to talk about the legalities of it. Is privacy something that we're guaranteed by law? And this, of course, is going to be U.S. centric since I'm American. Um, it's not. Privacy is never mentioned in the Constitution, which is what governs American law. Um, there is a lot of case law that is that is backed up and um, bolstered by the Bill of Rights, so the amendments to the Constitution that um, help us with data privacy. For instance, Americans do not have to give their passwords to their devices to a law enforcement officer or border crossing guard because it the contents on our devices could incriminate us and that is against that's what the fifth amendment protects us against about against self-incrimination so with that as a background number one we don't have a guaranteed legal right to privacy um let's talk about data being the new oil we've talked about this for almost two decades like 15 years or so when we started talking about it we were just talking about it being oil in the same sense as crude oil exists. And so you mine that data that comes from all the different information sources. Lots of stuff was just getting digitized. All of the government information about us, all of our credit card receipts, some of our the surveillance that happens when you go through um, uh, toll roads or when you go to a parking garage or when you go to um, get gas or any store that has surveillance up information and data we create, we shed so much data that it's crazy. So every website that we touch or um, lots of our apps shed this data and people create profiles for us, digital profiles. And that's how we get the ads we get. That's how we get the content on the different social media apps that we use. So all of this data, if they can mine this, you can make actionable, informa actionable information for it. Um, the, 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 caution to that is some of the information is not um, valid. It's not, it's not safe, good data. That was what's just what Rich was talking about before. Take some of our information if we're trying to put, especially new stuff with the edge and you think of what, how edge is setting itself up, right? There's all sorts of devices and all sorts of sensors to get this real time information about these boring, mundane, everyday things that happen to extract information to make our world better. That's the hope and the idea to make things so that, you know, that the buildings are smarter and cities are smarter and all the rest of these things. But sometimes that data can be put with the old digitized data. And if you think about some of the some of the data that we have if you think about people who are mostly incarcerated are usually people of color think about um, that type of data if that data is brought in with the real day-to-day -day, real-time activities that we can do things with now with iot devices and sensors on the edge if that's brought in to make decisions really quickly what will happen um, tech isn't politically neutral Anytime we set up a system or we, we create a new program, our biases go into it. And that's not necessarily saying that all of us are horrible racist people, but our biases might be that we would never think of an unintended consequence that somebody who is a person of color can see clear as day. And so those biases go into the creation process. And it's already a fact that this rapid automation and AI is disproportionately impacted, impacting um, disadvantaged communities. So are the privacy trade-offs worth it? If you look at the COVID uh, uh, epidemic right now, how can we create some kind of system where we can tell who's had the virus and who hasn't so we can get our economy going? How can we do that to make sure that it doesn't impact people who have less and have less advantages and make their lives even worse? The EFF guidelines are there. The, the questions are, will it work to solve the problem? Um, will it do too much harm to any audience? And are the safeguards being put in there su sufficient? And those are the things to look at. Great, thank you so much, Gina. We've already got a question uh, from the group. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute uh, John. Uh, just give me one second and then he can go ahead and ask his question.
John, you should be able to go ahead and unmute. There you go. Go ahead, John, you can ask your question. Hi, John. <laughs> we see you unmuted, but we don't hear your question. So I'll just read it out loud for now, and Gina, you can go ahead and answer it. Uh, should U.S. citizens push for a right to privacy law? Of course, I'm going to say yes, because of course I think that. <laughs> um, but pushing for the right to privacy law, again, has the same challenges um, to get that done, right? So we've got to make sure that if you push for, the, if any legislation is pushed, how do you make sure that it doesn't turn into a highly digitized new world version of Jim Crow laws, which I think are very easy to get done. So if, if the privacy laws are, are created with, um, with enough diverse in, input into what that is, and the reason for the diverse input is to make sure someone's got eyeballs on what could be uh, just a really horrible unintended consequence. Um, and yeah, I think we should have something um, because that's what other countries are doing. We have other countries that have um, laws and they're hot, more, much more surveilled than we are. So I think that that's the, the question is always going to be that. How do we, how are we able to take advantage of the technologies that are able to bring us better ways of life to make sure that it brings everybody a better way of life and we don't, you know, make things worse for some of us. Interesting, Gina. Thank you for that. We've got one more question um, from Jonas uh, Jacoby. Uh, Jonas, you should be able to uh, speak now. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yep, yeah. you sound good. Hi, Jonas. Hey, so I do have a question. Have you, uh, have you looked at what other countries have done in terms of privacy, especially if you're looking at Europe? I know, for example, Sweden has a pretty strict privacy law in place. But the other side of that coin is that anything that is available inside the government, meaning even your um, tax filings are public records and everybody owns them. So basically you can go in and check the prime minister's tax returns. Anyone can ask for them because they're public domain. But uh, other things are extremely strict in terms of privacy. Have you looked at other countries like that? Yeah, I haven't so much looked at the laws, just have heard things like you know, very general, like what you're talking about. And I think, you know, that's what is so interesting, even though we're a global community and we try to think of things to do, we're definitely, you know, even in the States, you know, we are so different from state to state as to what the citizens want. And then it's just very interesting of, of how politics work to get things done. Um, I think for me, you know, just thinking at it as it, of it as a technologist, you know, just to make sure that we're all thinking, like, what is this data? I mean, I, I thought that Rich's presentation was really interesting. <laughs> like, if you think of what this data is, you get all these sets of data. What if I get this set of data, but it's really, really biased? Is that good? Um, and if in your case, of course, like some of our tax records are um, public, at least in the state of Texas. I don't even know about that outside of Texas. But definitely, yeah, I would kind of like to see some of our politicians' tax returns. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that I, I'm not sure of the way out of it. Um, all the way, the thing I'm, I'm definitely sure of is there has to be some box around if we're going to, um, if, if we're going to create something new with the new technologies we have, we have to make sure that we don't bring in the old data and mix it together. And we have to think about unintended consequences for less served um, communities. Great. Thank, you. Thank you guys so much. Uh, Jonas, thanks for uh, asking the question. Really appreciate that. Um, and with that, thank you, Gina. Really appreciate it. And I'm going to invite my friend Mike. Assuming the half-life on Amy's computer uh, is a, a half an <laughs> Sorry hour. Sorry about computer. that. Give me a second. I'm coming back. <laughs> sorry. Hopefully with any luck, we'll be right, right mm -hmm. there. So sorry about that. Okay. You see it again? Hopefully. Yep. My screen, my slides are up. Great. Sorry about that. 
No problem. Thanks, Amy. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, kind of to follow on to Mark's presentation, I think everyone in America now knows the acronym WFH uh, versus those of us who've been working from home for some time. But I think even this isn't a pandemic driven issue. I think employees with the rise of mobility and internet access virtually everywhere, coffee shops or and what have you, it's, um, it's been, your employees have been working from anywhere for quite some time, whether you knew it or not. Uh, and this rapid transition to everyone uh, working from home has really made it um, clear and apparent that there's more and more needs for proper security measures, which should have been arguably in place to begin with. And oftentimes, um, employers will rush to put a perimeter-based security mechanism in place, whether that's requiring you to connect to a VPN or some other remote access. But it's very easy to bypass that. And, and employees and people in general don't like friction. And unfortunately, a lot of security solutions don't balance usability and security well. So I think moving to this concept of zero trust security, which uh, was just celebrated on Tuesday, I believe the 10 year anniversary of John Kindervag from uh, Forrester coining the term and starting to talk about this instead of uh, trust but verify, moving it to never trust and always verify. So assume you don't have any security, that your employees are working from an insecure location, uh, unencrypted connections, and how do you verify that they are who they, they're pretending to be or logged in as, and how do you make sure there's proper encryption in place, access controls, which is the role-based access control acronym there. Uh, and then my play on the PEBCAC acronym, if you're not familiar, problem exists between chair and keyboard, meaning the human element or, or layer eight. Uh, and now there's a security problem that exists between your chair and keyboard because everybody is sitting at home, probably not accessing securely or on different devices. And there's a bunch of mechanisms employers should have in place and hopefully are putting in place now, starting with simple things like two-factor or multi-factor authentication and proper audit logging. So you make sure that your employees are accessing the data that they should, kind of going back to what Rich talked about of, of data validity. And um, you know, hopefully we come out of this pandemic with a uh, better overall working environment and security combinations. So I will end there to be the one that doesn't go over three minutes. <laughs> Thanks. And sorry, Mike, about uh, the computer crashing for some reason that uh, was happening during yours. I apologize. Um, but does anybody have uh, a question that they want to go ahead and throw into the chat? Uh, we can go ahead and, oops, and the sharing is not happening. I thought it was, but it is not. So sorry about that. Great. Uh, does anybody have a question for Mike that they want to go ahead and ask? We can go ahead and unmute your uh, mic if anybody has a question. And one more time, if anybody has a question for Mike, uh, we can go ahead and do that. Okay, there is a question uh, from Jonas. I will go ahead and unmute you, Jonas. Hi, again. Go ahead. Um, this is um, uh, just a question. It, it can be either Mark or, or Mike that responds to this, I guess. Um, it, it, I just got off uh, a very large company, IBM, and obviously they have, you know, their, uh, a lot of their security protocols for working uh, remotely uh, in place. Um, and obviously they, they provide you with all the software and, um, uh, and hardware that you need in order to successfully work from home. But, um, you know, if you're a startup, you may not be able to do that. How do you, how do you, um, how do you, uh, deal with this type of issue if you are a relatively young startup. No, I'm not talking about a garage company now. I'm talking about a company that is, say, between you know 25 and 200 people. Yeah, arguably, it's easier for a startup because you don't have to 
build security awareness programs for uh, a massive scale. Sure. So I think there's some very basic things, like I mentioned, that you should require, being yeah. every service has two-factor or multi-factor authentication, and explaining and setting context with each employee of why that's important. Uh, then there's things like uh, other security awareness training, like anti-phishing or what phishing is, and then layering up from there. So making sure you have proper encryption for sensitive data. You have, like I mentioned, proper audit logging and making sure that these security initiatives are not a one and done, that they're part of your culture. And as you build your startup up, you never lose fact that security should be ingrained. It shouldn't be a bolt on or a penalty where you take security training once a year uh, and kind of tick the box. So I, I think that like, if you really want to start a proper startup and not have it fail due to some security event, those are the measures I would start with. Uh, and just a, a real quick add to um, Mike, asked Mike a question, but uh, time, uh, and so I'll let Julie ask the question, but I want to answer Jonas a little bit as well, is if you think about um, security, and, and Mike is you know, uh, obviously expert in, um, in discussing this particular topic, but the part of the, and not a but about Mike, uh, but about the scenario is that security needs to be considered from a training and business standpoint in ways um, you know, knock sensible. Uh, when you're in the office and you leave a document on your desk that nobody, chances are nobody that shouldn't see it is going to see it. That's just the, the truth. Somebody could see it if they social engineered or if they were trying to steal from you and they were working next to you. But generically speaking, no one else is likely to see it. But if you're working in a cafe and you printed something from your printer or you working in your and your husband who works at a company or somebody else happens to be there. So security is not just in the client. Security is in how you handle the information that you enter into the client or that you move from the client. And lastly, associated with that is something that's almost impossible, especially as you get larger. Um, it's just such a hard thing to do is defining categories of information so that it's simplified into how and where you do encrypt and what in fact constitutes, you know, um, confidential, completely secret, uh, private, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, it's a complex issue. And, and, you know, back to what Mike said, training is, is at the top of the list. Thanks, Mark. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, unmute Ju uh, Julie so you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Julie O'Grady, I'm a permanent company, a startup called Lucid Link, and I've been studying the media and entertainment um, space a lot. And it's, one, it's an example of one industry that has really had to scramble in terms of remote access, you know, for post-production video editors and colorists, et cetera. And, I, and, and everything I've heard from industry talks is they, they weren't leading with security because they were just trying to get people up and running again. Um, and so I'm, I guess I'm, my question is for, you know, like for an industry like say media and entertainment, for um, organizations that might have to do a little backpedaling now, um, besides all the great advice we talked about, you know, training people, which obviously hasn't happened in every scenario, like what are some first steps to kind of gain back a, a foothold in, 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 on the security realm? I think one thing I didn't mention is if I were running the company or had budgetary approval, I would distribute a proper password manager to every employee. Mm -hmm. So things like one password or, or last pass. And right. then, and for that, in, well, it's not just uh, standard for that industry, but moving to a shared cloud file storage, mm -hmm. such as box Dropbox, where everybody can collaborate, but it's in one place. It's not, okay, um, Amy has the master on her laptop. She has to email, email it around. You never know what the source of truth is. And then that laptop gets stolen and then you've lost IP. So I think those are a couple simple measures that, could, that companies can you know, come up to speed or backpedal and get back on pace fairly easily. Great, great, thank you. Thanks. All right, uh, we are at the point now where we like to call it our open mic Q&A. Obviously, we're a little bit over time, uh, so we don't quite have the 15 minutes left. Uh, we are at, towards the end of the call, but um, given if uh, folks want to go ahead and stay on 
uh, what we'll go ahead and do is we'll actually unmute all the lines if anybody has a question, uh, which is not our norm. Uh, but uh, since we've only got just a couple more minutes left, um, I've gone ahead and I have unmuted uh, all the phone lines. Uh, and if anybody wants to go ahead and uh, ask a question, I would recommend first typing it in the chat just so it doesn't get too chaotic. Um, and then we'll go ahead and assign it to the uh, speaker that is best to answer it. Uh, so it looks like <laughs> Mark Tuley has a question for somebody. So let's go to Mark Tuley. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Mike, you know, I, I wanted to ask a question because I, um, uh, I, I love your perspective on the security angle and thinking about it that way. What's the... Um, kind of the best practice for um, determining uh, data segregation on a remote client, especially if it's not a client you own relative to the strategy that you're talking about. And I, I wanna give that more explanation because that's kind of a big um, topic area, but to give you some bad examples that you're probably familiar with, uh, examples of doing things poorly. I mean, uh, you know, when you're, you're using an exchange server and you're using OWA as an example in the back in the day. And if you were um, using your client, uh, using somebody else's client, like a, a stand-up uh, podium or something at an airport, uh, you would leave not realizing that you'd left the file you were looking at in effectively a downloads folder that now is available to almost anyone else who uses that client. And there's a lot of security issues like that still remaining in applications that exist today. Do you have any suggestions in general for you know, either auditing for that or preparing ahead of time, other than what we've both talked about, which is, you know, training, training, training. So I think you're talking about legacy views on data loss prevention or, or DLP solutions, right? Yeah. Because the bottom line is a lot of our apps are not modern apps, right? And so we still have to use them and we have to be successful with them. Yeah, so it's a combination of always of employee awareness training, but everybody's susceptible to just making that mistake of just forgetting you're rushed, your kids are doing something and you're at that public terminal and you just, you have to go. Uh, I think there's a few startups or, or post startups that are trying to address this in a new modern way. One of those is Vera Security, hmm. which allows you to um, secure documents so they can't be transferred, you know, who they got transferred to, they can't be printed or uh, taken a screenshot. And then you can have, uh, an expiration date, so kind of a virtual shredder on it. So if somehow it did get left open on a public terminal, it would expire at some point. Still not perfect. I don't think there's any perfect solution. It's it goes back to classic defense in depth approaches, right? Like knowing who accessed what and when, right. and then if if there and it's if there is an incident, it's trying to limit your your time of exposure. Right. Right. Awesome. Thanks. Hey, John, you got a question? Oh, John asked a question. All right, John, why don't you just speak up? Ask away. John's his mic's not, his oh, his mic's mic's not, not working. working so we oh, that's the one we answered earlier. Got it. Okay. Now, he said he hasn't heard anything about security if BYOD scenario. Is that the one, John? Got it, got it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, Mike, you want to start with that one? Happy to jump in as well. Yeah, well, sorry, what was the full question? It's You're off my screen. You're in a BYOD scenario, right? I don't, I don't think it changes too much, but. Yeah, I mean, I've, my personal view on this and back when BYOD first became an acronym, I said it should be use any device and you should assume that employees are going to use whatever devices whenever. And then it's about kind of tying back into what Rich spoke about. It's about securing the data and knowing who accessed it, when and how. Yeah. Like you, you, can't, you can't think about securing the device. I think there was a bunch of vendors that tried to put you know, the, the virtual firewall on a device, which just people got frustrated. They're like, I don't need this device. I can access, especially SaaS apps, like my email provider from yeah. any device. And now you've subverted that security. So yeah. you know, I think like I talked to, or a flippant comment I made about privacy is it really needs to start with context, not trying to control everybody. Right. Yep. I'd agree with that. And the only thing I would add to that, uh, um, of what Mike said, John, is um, that the the problem, you know, and, and part of my um, discussion earlier is I'm I'm recognizing that 
as much as you know, Mike or Rob or I or anybody else on the call might live in something approaching a perfect world where we've been sort of working in this uh, method already and we're just moving forward into you know, more of the same effectively, um, is that for a lot of organizations, they don't have time to, or haven't taken the time, as in fact, one of the questions we received, haven't taken the time to determine um, a brand new strategy for how to enable any client to work, relatively speaking, securely uh, with company documents and, and company access. And so the, you know, from a BYOD standpoint, uh, a lot of the topics that uh, Mike already mentioned relative to two-factor authentication, training around what to look for, training around phishing, et cetera. But what you really can't try to do is say, well, you've got a, your own uh, three-year-old uh, HP client and we all use um, you know, brand new Dells in the office. We're gonna bring it in and try to load a bunch of software on there that'll make you unworkable, right? So that's just not an option. And so thinking, thinking through the ways to, to find the appropriate medium is um, critical at this point in, in making people productive because in the end, you don't, want, you don't want a leader who follows you around every minute, but you also don't wanna be in theory enabled with tools that make you 20% less productive than you would have been had you been sitting at your desk in the office. Thanks, Mark. Um, we're at, let's see, about 4.20 p.m. Pacific time. Apologies again for the technology challenges today. Uh, I would say probably at this point, uh, maybe we have time for one more question and then we can bring the Zoom speakeasy to a close. Um, does anybody else have a particular comment or a question uh, at this point? And again, I apologize, I did lose the chat on this last crash. <laughs> but uh, someone who maybe didn't ask a question that, that would like to ask them. I have a question for Gina. Go for it, Mike. If and when do you think the U.S. equivalent of GDPR gets rolled out across all 50 states? I don't think it will. I, I don't think that's our... Um, I don't... I can't see politically now that ever happening. <laughs> I just can't. So, I mean, I know there was a comment in the chat about, you know, should we legislate it? And, and I'm not sure if it should be legislated because I don't think it can be legislated. I, and I have m much more of a fear about um, unintended consequences, especially with some of our government officials than anything else. And I can definitely see, um, I, I can't see, I, I think that what's going on with the coronavirus and um, contact tracing, especially, is very, very interesting. You know, if you look and see, there's there's so many elements to it. Number one is just the politics. The politics, no matter how you wanna talk about it, is an ugly, ugly angle. And um, the surveillance business has already, it's been driving tech, it's been driving startups, it's been driving all sorts of stuff um, because it's so hot. People, the government and law enforcement are using huge, um, applications that are able to suck up every piece of data we shed every piece of data about us and make decisions and some of the data is not um it, it is tainted it's really bad so you've got that on one side you've got state governments that are don't have money um already trying to 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 make sure that there's no fraud with benefits to make sure that if somebody really needs it they're getting the benefits that they have the budget for um, and they're using different types of AI and automation that is punishing poor people for being poor. Like if, if you've not read, um, oh, what's the name of the book? Um, Automated Inequality, I think is what it's called. That's why I had my slides with everything on it because I forget words. But it, it, that's what's happening is they're pulling in this data that's older. I didn't put it on these slides. <laughs> they're, they're putting in these, this data that's older. There's one example of, there was a couple of cases of fraud in a state. They used this um, big, they use this AI to make sure they basically cut out the human middle person. Don't put the middle per human in the middle because they're gonna try to fraud us and take this money for themselves. We'll make sure only the right people that need the, the money or, or whatever benefits are gonna get it. Um, so one lady was dealing with u uterine cancer or something and couldn't make her appointment to go and, and um, you know, prove, yes, I'm really, really poor. You really need some help. And all of her benefits got cut off, all of them. And she died because she didn't have any um, benefits to go to the hospital to get treated and got the benefits back the next day. 
So you have these things that are so draconian that are draconian on the people that need it the most and have the least. That's already happening. Then you have all of us now, we're looking at the at COVID. We all want to get back to normal. We all, I want to go get my nails done. I want to go get my hair done. I want to go see all of you beautiful people. We can't do it because, you know, this novel virus is so deadly. So are, is there a way for us to tell by our phones and what they're, what they're using is Bluetooth. So you, you have an app that uses Bluetooth. If it, it detects when you're near somebody for an, a, an amount of time within six feet of them, wherever the places you are, if that person ends up having the virus, you get a notification to go into, um, to go into isolation. All of the businesses shut down and clean for two hours. This is the kind of thing they're working on. What, so what information gets given up? If you're in Singapore, if you're in Korea, if you're in China, because of the differences in those countries and how they deal with information and privacy, you have to give up all of your information. And that's marked, and this is where the idea of these passports, if you wanna travel, you've got a clean bill of health. In China, that happens already. You have a little app. If it's green, you're good. You can go anywhere you wanna go. Um, well, what does that mean? Are there any unintended consequences that can come from that? You've already got, you know, I hear my black guy friends don't want to wear masks out in public. They desperately do, but they're terrified to do it. Like, should we put pink ones on? Should we put like Disney princesses on it to make us look less big and black? Because that's um, unfortunately, it's something that's going to get them hurt and killed. We've got that basic thing. We don't have, what worries me is we don't have the people that are making the app working with people that are afraid to wear a mask, let alone opening up um, their private data to everybody else to create something that's safe for everybody. So I've talked a whole bunch, but like basically the, that's the whole, I, I have no idea how in our political state right now in the States, there are definitely forces that, uh, that intend on, that, that, are, that have bad intentions towards groups of people. There are forces that are trying to do the right thing but it's not doing the right thing because their data, they're not using the data correctly. Then we have folks not thinking about what could happen to people that don't look like them. So I don't, I don't see us ever getting to GDPR, <laughs> my opinion. Really, really good, good answer, Gina. Um, obviously now we're you know, just sorry. about it. No, 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 you're great. And I think it was really interesting. And if you look at the chat, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks, um, you know, chiming in with some questions. Um, because we are at the end of our time, I would go ahead and say if anybody has questions or comments they want to send along to any of the speakers from today, go ahead and send that to email to cloud2030 at googlegroups.com. And we'll make sure that uh, Gina and the rest of the uh, um, you know, founding members get those questions answered. Um, we will be looking again for a number of uh, guest speakers continually. So if you are interested uh, in, uh, in uh, either identifying a topic that you're interested in, or if you'd like to be a guest speaker, you can go ahead and send that email in again to cloud2030 at googlegroups.com. At this time, I'd like to thank uh, all of our speakers again for all of your time and engagement. Sorry for the technical issues. We'll try and get those fixed um, before next time. Our next uh, Zoom speakeasy will be May 14th, 2020. So look forward to speaking with everyone again soon. Stay safe, uh, everybody stay healthy and look forward to talking again soon. Thanks everybody, take care. Bye-bye, thank you.